Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Fung. I'm a technology reporter here at The Post. And uh, joining me today, we've got three fantastic panelists. Beside me here is Raj Kapoor, who's the uh, uh, VP of, I'm sorry, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Lyft. Um, we also have Jessica Robinson, who's the Director of City Solutions at Ford Smart Mobility. And finally, Jeffrey Tumlin, who's the Principal and Director of Strategy at Nelson Nygaard, a transportation consultancy. Um, so, you know, this panel is all about the future of transportation in cities, something that I'm very passionate about um, as someone who bikes to work every day and, uh, you know, is really interested in the future of self-driving cars and how that's going to change cities. So, um, Jeffrey, let me just start with you. Uh, Waymo said last week that it would begin taking the <coughs> test drivers uh, out of its self-driving cars in Phoenix. Um, what do you expect we'll see from that transition? What kind of challenges uh, do you think we'll, you know, Waymo will face as it tries to um, put this into practice? Um, and, and what are we going to learn from this process about uh, self-driving cars? Well, in the short run, I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of change or difference. In the longer run, though, the changes are going to be profound, as well as the challenges. I mean, one of the really interesting challenges is how do autonomous vehicles deal <coughs> with urban stop sign controlled intersections where there are lots of pedestrians, right? So when you're at a stop sign uh, and everyone arrives at the same time, there's a certain kind of social ability that kicks in, like, no, no, you go, no, you go. With autonomous vehicles, you end up with either the courtesy standoff, where nobody knows who gets to go next, or probably more likely, pedestrians simply take over. Because as soon as the safety protocols say that you have to stop the car for the kid bouncing the ball into the street, that'll take pedestrians in cities about five minutes to realize they can just cross whenever and wherever they want. Uh, sounds great for walkability. <laughs> well, until we start criminalizing pedestrian behavior further, like we did in the 1930s when we invented the term jaywalking, which was a term that AAA promoted um, and then went to state legislatures to criminalize. So Jessica, how are self-driving cars um, handling this, this issue of um, you know, manners and, uh, and politeness on public roads? Yeah, so it's, it's really important to think about the human vehicle interaction, and Jeff raised a couple good points. Um, but I think it goes to a deeper question of what do we really want autonomous vehicles to do? for us in our cities. And I think there's a real potential uh, to improve access um, and the way people can, can get around and experience our cities. Um, but certainly safety is a part of what's going to be important for the rollout of, quite frankly, any technology. So it's something our engineers are looking at pretty deeply. Um, we're running a number of experiments now to see um, how people and uh, vehicles might interact together, whether it's lights or other things. Um, there's been some funny videos on the internet about that as well, a, a guy dressed um, like a driver's <laughs> seat uh, driving along, and you can kind of see people do a double take and say, what's going on in there? Um, what's really important is people being com becoming comfortable with this technology. Um, we've done some things before where um, we put the LiDAR of the vehicles up and people can actually stand in front of it and, and do a selfie. Um, and it's, it's really funny because people have never seen themselves through the eyes of a self-driving car before. Um, and so we're all learning how to, to work through these things together in real time. So Raj, uh, your company Lyft is partnering with Ford and a number of other companies, Waymo also, um, on self-driving cars. Um, tell us some of what you've learned from that partnership so far. Sure. So first of all, um, from a consumer perspective, I think it was correctly pointed out that there's a lot of questions that consumers have, and they have a lot of questions around trust. So we've done some experiments with consumers, and one of the first things they want to do when they get into a car is they're asking themselves the question, what is this car seeing? And then the second question is, is this car behaving the way I would behave? So what we've done is actually created a console, which we've launched with a few of our partners that takes in all the object level data that the car is seeing because a lot of what self-driving is is that we're teaching a car perception and to understand the environment around it. So we're taking in objects, it could be other cars, could be people, bringing those in, putting it and showing it actually on a little uh, Android tablet and what, showing the car there on what it's seeing and how it's maneuvering. And that brings down, um, I think, the fear level and it brings the trust in. They do that a couple times, then they'll swi swipe over and start looking at music and controls and things like that. Uh, one comment I want to make, though, is that this is going to be, you know, in question around Waymo and others, is that this is going to be a very gradual change. 
because the reality of the situation in the field today is that uh, most autonomous vehicles are slowly learning the world around them. Think about the, pot, the number of scenarios that a potential car has to encounter. It's the, the kid throwing the ball. It, it could be, I think, one scenario that uh, Waymo has looked at is uh, grandma walking across the street with a stop sign. And what do you do about that? <laughs> so there's all sorts of things that we haven't even thought about. And so the comfort level with the vehicle to be able to deal with what could be a potential infinite number of scenarios is going to take a while. So what we view it is, and this is where we think ride sharing plays a role, is because the consumer is used to picking out their phone, calling a ride, the ride comes over. What we're able to do is to dispatch a ride in real time, look at, is this AV safe? Is this AV capable? And then on, only then dispatch an AV ride. But we think for the next decade or more, it's, it's, it's going to be a combination of human drivers and AV drivers, even in ride sharing, and that will slowly get people comfortable as well, mm -hmm. that we're making those decisions. Let me just pause here and remind everyone that you can ask questions also <coughs> of the panelists here um, by using the hashtag transformers. Um, we're going to be taking questions um, from the audience uh, yeah, over, over Twitter. And um, hopefully you guys will have some, will be able to chime in with some great questions also. Um, Raj, let me just uh, uh, follow up on what you were just saying. You know, with your partnership um, with these companies, you've placed a heavy emphasis on data sharing and um, you know, uh, pushing the industry forward as a whole. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like on the day-to-day? -day? You know, how much can Ford see of the data that Waymo is collecting and vice versa, for example? So we are, we're very clear, though, that we're not sharing Ford's data with Waymo or Waymo's data with Ford in doing that. What we're able to do is take the network data that we have and help these systems to be able to understand and recognize scenarios uh, that are out there. You know, one of the issues that we're also trying to solve is, for example, there are certain elements that all of the partners uh, need, like an HD map. So for those that aren't familiar with how an autonomous vehicle works, um, the vehicle, the first thing it needs to do is to figure out where am I in the world. And in order to do that, you can't use the Google Maps that we all use in our phone because the accuracy is too low. It needs to know down to the centimeter level of where it is. It's called localization. And the best way to do that right now is to use a high definition map. The problem is high definition maps don't exist today. And the industry is trying to fill that void, but to create a high definition map. And the second piece is to keep it refreshed at a rate that is constant with the world that's changing around it is a very big task. So since we have, Lyft now has almost 800,000 uh, drivers just in the United States that are going out on a daily basis to go get, uh, to do rides, our ability to collect that data using those drivers is something that we're, we're hoping that we can help the industry with and provide them with some safe and reliable mapping capability. So that's one example. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jeff, maybe you can tell us, you know, these companies are collecting all this data about the environment, um, and it's all going to be fed into some really advanced navigational systems and um, perception systems. But what kinds of businesses could be built on top of this um, data layer? Well, it depends upon who can get access to the business and it, or to the data, and it also depends upon what's the role of government in being able to see and manage that data. So one of the great data concerns that I have is as technology changes and proliferates, which is really good, who is managing the transportation system as a whole? What is the role of government in collecting data uh, that is gathered in the public right of way? So cities own the operating environment for all of these transportation providers um, and is providing that operating <coughs> environment free for private benefit. Um, can cities get the right amount of data in order to manage the system as a whole without violating um, either the business interests of the private operators or the privacy of the individuals who are moving? Right? This is one of the great challenges. And I think we need to answer that question first before we can figure out uh, what's happening with the data among other private users. Mm -hmm. Jessica, how, um, have, you, have you guys begun having these conversations with cities? And if so, what does that look like? We have. Um, this is something that um, comes up in pretty much every conversation. <laughs> we have. Um, there's, and there's a, a, a lot of things to unpack within the question of data and privacy. Um, one of the areas that I think is important that we don't always talk about um, is where there are data gaps today. Uh, and, and there's many, including uh, things like how our public transit networks work um, and where riders are 
going, where they're accessing the system, how can transit agencies actually better optimize what they're doing? Um, and for us, that's as important as the questions of our vehicles as sensors feeding into a broader um, transportation network. Um, because if you if you sit down with someone who runs a bus company, or excuse me, a transit agency today, uh, they will tell you uh, all kinds of things that they don't understand about how their routes are being run. What's an example? Um, they don't necessarily know. Um, an example is if the DOT changes the timing on a traffic light, um, that will impact the time between two bus stops. And uh, they may not have gotten that update, or maybe the systems don't talk together today. So that impacts the bus. So if you're standing there waiting, and now the DOT changes stop, the bus is now two minutes late every day. Or worse, the bus is now two minutes early every day, and you miss your bus, and now you have to wait for the next one. Mm. Um, and so it's only through that coordination that this vision of efficient systems working together is going to be really important. And it's going to take collaboration from organizations that may not be used to working together. It's going to take these really hard discussions between the um, private sector and the public sector and representatives from the communities to say, what do we actually want? What are we willing to trade off? What's non-negotiable? At the end of the day, Ford believes that we, you, we all own our own data, and that's the starting point for these conversations. Raj, uh, we were speaking earlier about um, this idea of having a citywide operating system almost for, for transit. Um, describe you know, for the audience a little bit what that vision, uh, how that vision operates. Yeah, and just to comment first around um, you know the the use of data. I think that this really transportation is one of those interesting areas in a city that is has to be a public-private partnership that's there, and it's get increasingly getting to be important that way. As the, from a consumer's perspective, the lines start to blur between is it ride sharing, is it a bus, is it a shared ride sharing, and transit, all those things, and I think they're going to exist in totality that are there. One example of how we've, we've done this is just here in DC. Um, DC, I, I don't know if any of you are hanging out on Connecticut Avenue near DuPont Circle at 1 AM on a Friday or Saturday night, and now no one's shaking their head yes. Um, but uh, it's pretty crowded. And there's always a, a, a backup of, of lifts, others, taxis, et cetera, that are there. So we worked with the city utilizing our data to try to figure out where are the hot spots among, among Connecticut Avenue. And what the city was able to do was then to take out 60 parking spots and replace them with designated drop off and pick up, which has significantly reduced the congestion. And it's also safer for people at 1 AM. You don't want them driving their car um, anyway around that time. So that's an example where we're able to utilize data in a safe way, in a, in a way that doesn't harm the private uh, ownership of that data and that information. Going back to your question around the city, what I think is exciting uh, is that you know, transit is not going away. Even in the world of autonomous vehicles at full tilt, if you look at um, light rail as an example, the economics of running light rail are always going to be uh, si significantly better than, than having a vehicle, even if it's a shared vehicle or a pooled vehicle, the way that uh, a lot of Lyft is today. Um, so what it's going to be is a combination. What the consumer is going to care about, and I, I went and spoke to about 45 different cities around the world when I first started this role to understand what their needs were. And it was clear that the consumer wanted a way to be able to figure out what's the best way to get from point A to point B in the city. And different people have different trade-offs on cost. They have different trade-offs on time, on comfort, number of changes. But they want to have that information. So to the extent that the private industry can do that, but we need, as mentioned, the public information around transit so that we can make that connection. Today, a popular use of Lyft is around first mile, last mile to transit, because a lot of people don't live within walking distance, either, to, either at their home or their work or wherever. So it's being able to connect the ride in so that they can do this on a regular basis. That's a great example where we need to, we need to look at the data of transit, and they need to understand how ride sharing is going to work and have designated pickup and drop off. Do you guys think that in the future, consumers are going to start thinking about transit differently? Are we going to have to redefine what we think of as transit? My view is that consumers will be thinking about, how do I get from point A to point B? And what is the best way to get there? And if we're do all doing our job right and working together, it should be pretty seamless. Mm -hmm. As for the payment methods, the ways to get there, 
and the navigation. And that will require that public transit agencies start thinking about their customers. <laughs> I won't read anything into that. <laughs> it also, I think, raises a point of what is the role of a public transit agency. And they're asking themselves these questions. And for many uh, of our transit operators, they've been stuck with these 40, 50 foot buses as the only solution, as if that is the only solution. And so um, in the conversations we have, people are very <coughs> excited about the opportunity to have different kinds of vehicles, different pricing structures, um, working with a variety of solutions to actually deliver on the core promise of public transit, which is to help people move around. And I think you know, in those honest moments, if we all reflect, um, very few cities actually deliver on that today, and that's what's really important here, is figuring out collectively how do we make mobility accessible in cities to people so that we can get to work, can get to school, um, because the time that it takes you to get to work is actually linked to your own ability to improve your situation in life, um, and transit doesn't always do that today. In many places it does, and it's a critical first step. Mm -hmm. Right, and the one place actually that is a standout today is Seattle of all places. Seattle is the only city in the country right now of any real size where bus ridership is significantly growing. In other cities like San Francisco and New York, bus ridership is significantly down as a result of Uber and Lyft, which means that the transportation system's ability to move people is declining in New York and San Francisco. In Seattle, it's growing, but only because the city stepped up its leadership to get transit to deliver a quality product because it's the city that owns transit's operating environment. The city controls the street, it controls all the traffic signals. And Seattle said, uh, yeah, our current method of measuring success in our transportation system uh, is about the movement of vehicles, which means that a person on board a 40 passenger bus is valued at 1 40th the value of somebody driving alone in a car. And people on foot or on bike it's not that they don't matter, it's that they only matter insofar as they get in the way of the free flow of traffic. This is our primary way of measuring mobility success in every single city in the United States. It's called intersection level of service. Seattle has shifted <coughs> towards looking not at vehicle movement, but at person movement, so that it can give priority to the most space efficient modes of transportation particularly walking, biking, and public transit. The result of that, transit faster, frequent, more frequent, more reliable. The result of that is people are taking it in droves because we value our time. So um, how does that work in, say, a city like DC where you have a broad metropolitan area, uh, lots of folks commuting into downtown areas, um, and there's a lot of sort of competition for space on the road, um, you know, b both between drivers, but also between drivers and cyclists, drivers and pedestrians. How does that work in a, a city like this? So all public transit agencies have a structural flaw in that they don't control their operating environment, and many of them are unclear about why they exist. So correcting for that flaw requires a partnership between the municipalities and the public transit agency, where there's a deal that's struck that says, all right, city, I control the streets and the signals. <coughs> if I give you better travel time, if I can make your buses faster, I need you to invest that savings into improved frequency and improved reliability, right? If cities and transit agencies operate together, uh, not only can they improve transit, but they can be much better partners for companies like Lyft and Ford as they're creating new technologies to do the things that transit's not good at. So, you know, Lyft and autonomous vehicles are great at making first and last mile connections, getting from the bus stop to your destination, serving places that are of lower density that can't really be served uh, with larger vehicles. Um, they're great at operating services off hours. They're not great at primary commute service because they're space inefficient, particularly compared to buses or, or subways. So if cities get into the driver's seat and figure out the right roles for each of these different transportation technologies, then we can really experience the benefit. But if we turn over the public right-of-way to private profit, then the public loses. 
Jessica, would you agree with, with that? So I think what Jeff calls out, which is really important here, is the, the right option for the right trip. Um, and certainly, I think, I mean, even if you look on the street out here um, right now, uh, there is a, a crush of uh, desire to, to be in the cities that we love and call home. But that crush comes with cars and congestion and delivery vehicles blocking the road because our consumer behavior has shifted and we're ordering so much stuff online now, right? Um, and so I think there will be broader discussions about when and how and where um, the right vehicle is the right choice. Um, from a consumer side, um, we see a world where there's much more fluidity across all of these, um, these choices. Uh, and that's only enabled by public transit uh, and, again, the private sector working together. But I think it's important also to talk about the, the context here, which is the city itself, right? And the demographers tell us that you know, in the not too distant future, something like 70% of the world will live in cities. And so for us at Ford, that's why it's so important to have these conversations with leaders at the city level. It's because these are the places where the decisions are going to be made that have true impact on uh, transportation systems globally. Mm -hmm. And if uh, we don't have that discussion, we'll just continue to see um, roads being blocked and people not being able to move. Raj, what do you, what do you think about future street design? Um, and, and what have you seen you know, in your travels around the world, mm -hmm. talking to other cities? What jumps out at, at you as being some of the cities that are doing things right? Yeah. So first, just want to level set. Um, when we started this company, and I was one of the early investors and on the board when we were about a 15-person company, and Logan started this, Logan Green, a while ago, it was through his travels. He was actually in Zimbabwe and found that he was going on these shuttle services that were, were saving the number of cars because they would be stopping and people were basically carpooling. And so he thought in the age of the internet, why can't we have this inefficient use of cars connected using a network online and have less people uh, or have less cars that are available. So since day one, our mantra has been about fewer cars. We, you know, we don't even look at ourselves as a ride-sharing company. Our mission is to improve people's lives with, it, with the best transportation. And I think in the future, you will see a blur between what we do. It's about getting you from point A to point B. It's about partnering with transit to make that possible um, in doing that. So I think there's a, there is a, um, a significant push towards uh, bringing those together from a data perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of leads into my next question, which is that we've, you know, in Washington, we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, industry consolidation, acquisitions, uh, vertical integration, where you have companies, um, you know, in one space buying up uh, companies who are operating in adjacent or um, or related sectors. Uh, do you think we could see something similar happen in transportation? Um, you know, obviously, the shift into autonomous vehicles is kind of a natural evolution out of uh, traditional. Um, you know, auto making, but uh, but it's also a sort of uh, adjacent market, if you will. So, do you, see, you sort of see that more of that happening in the future? Well, I mean, we've used acquisitions as a way to um, beef up the number of mobility solutions that we have. So, we acquired a company called Chariot, which is based in San Francisco. Uh, their micro transit service, and what was really important to us about the idea of micro transit is it fills in a gap between um, the benefits of cars owned. Um, and driving yourself around and public transit. And it's a flexible vehicle. But more importantly, and why cities seem to really be excited about it is it's shared. Mm. Um, so you have some of those um, geometric benefits of having multiple people together in the footprint of one car. Um, so yes, acquisitions are important. Um, we continue to be <coughs> building a number of our own solutions. Uh, the other thing that I think is important in, for us in the idea of working on a portfolio of solutions is partnerships. So whether it's um, with a, a large organization like Lyft or startups that we might meet through an accelerator in Detroit that we work with, Techstars Mobility, um, it's going to take being open and creative to finding different solutions in different places. Mm -hmm. I think as, as cars switch to becoming autonomous, the market is no longer the car itself. Mm -hmm. The people who are going to be making money in the automobile space are going to be the ones who figure out 
what to do with the time of the occupants inside the vehicle, right? So there are two ways in which to make money off of cars in the future. One is the Alphabet or Google model or Waymo model, which is all about advertising, right? Google's revenue model is ads. What's the greatest ad media space in the history of advertising? The inside of an autonomous vehicle. The other way of making money is through bundled services. Figure out what else can you sell to the person who no longer needs to pay attention to the road in front of her, uh, and where you've got her credit card information and demographic inf information, and you know, you know where she's going to or from, and it's linked to all of her social media accounts. Like, what can we sell her, <laughs> right? Those are gonna be the two models, uh, and we need to understand that in order for cities to be able to predict what's gonna be the impact on travel behavior, particularly if mobility in the future is free. Like, why not live three hours away from where you work? Because you can, you know, play your PlayStation or do whatever it is that people are gonna be doing in autonomous vehicles uh, on, their, on their commute. Um, so we've got a couple questions here from Twitter. One is um, you know, a question for Jeff, uh, if you could just sort of expand on this idea of an operating environment um, for, for cities and how do we define or redefine streets and sidewalks in a world of autonomous vehicles? So the operating environment is the public street. It's the public right of way. Cities own between 25 and about 35% of the land area. It's publicly owned. and. We need to make sure that this greatest asset that cities own is used for the public good. And this means managing it with the idea of not vehicle throughput, but person throughput in mind. How do we make sure that we make the most geometrically efficient use of city streets in its job to move people and goods? This creates an opportunity uh, as well to recognize that congestion it's not a technology or an infrastructure problem, it's an economic problem. Congestion is simply what happens when the demand for mobility equals the supply. And like every other commodity, the only way to solve an economic problem is through economic tools and particularly pricing. Like, the one thing we've socialized in America is our streets. So pricing the road is something we can finally do um, when private companies, <coughs> through shared mobility, are operating on our streets. We can make the price invisible to the consumer and no longer about charging the individual at a 19th century toll booth, but you know, charging you know, private corporations, right? Uh, and then it just comes through in the bill. It also means that we can charge for empty seats and empty cargo space so that we reward the most space efficient trip rather than punishing the most space efficient trip, which is what we do now. Um, so if cities can have a grown-up conversation about how we're managing the streets in order to achieve the public good for efficiency, but also make sure that we don't let go of walkability and bikeability and suffer the public health consequences of ubiquitous door-to-door -door mobility replacing all walk trips, um, then we end up with fantastic cities and cities that private uh, mobility providers can thrive in. Well, Comment on that, you know. Uh, so we now, we do have a very popular shared service called Lyft Line. What's interesting about it is that uh, of those returning passengers of Lyft now, it comprises 50% of their rides, and overall, it's about 40% of all rides uh, in cities that it's available. It has grown significantly, exactly because of the premise. Rather than waiting for the city, we took it upon ourselves to make that service less expensive in doing it. So the first thing they do is they say, "Oh, I could save 30% by having a shared ride." So right away, the consumer does it. Then the second thing they think about is, ooh, is it creepy to sit next to someone I don't really know? Then they realize, you know, this world of phones, they put down their phone for a second and talk to a human being, and they actually enjoy the experience. Um, and so we have found that that service is something that's there. I think what you're saying, if the city can also provide further incentive, we're very much aligned with that. Some interesting things that I did see around, around uh, cities being redesigned when I was visiting the world, Auckland has done an amazing job of basically setting up real time, their buses, their trains, but also roads, they're moving to the point where if you want to go from point A to point B, the entire road journey will be dynamically told based upon where you're going, occupancy, and a lot of other factors that are going on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, places like Paris are doing some interesting things around you know, the fewer cars mantra that we talked about, 
greening uh, their streets more, providing a lot more walkways, providing designated pickups and drop-offs for buses as well as for ride sharing. So there's a lot of things that cities can do uh, to improve. It, and I would add, I think it's important, you know, we've talked about throughput and efficiency. An equally valid question is maybe some of that space shouldn't be for movement anymore, right? And you yeah. touched on that too. And that's one of the things in our design lab we're thinking about is you see many cities experimenting now with parklets and other pop-up uses of the street space. Um, it is entirely possible uh, that we can take full lanes out for vehicle use, maybe reallocate them to bicycling or pedestrian space, but maybe they become trees or urban playgrounds or all kinds of other things become possible when we, we re-envision um, what we want our cities to actually be. And I think that's the, the real important question here is with the arrival of all of these new technologies and connectivity and coordination, um, cities are really saying, let's pause and have these conversations and say, how does this fit in how we envision uh, what we want our homes to, to be like, both today, but also into the future? Can I just point out that it was Ford that just said all that? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the other piece that's interesting, you, you mentioned uh, around the, the public roadways, is this, there's this uh, public-private area of parking spaces that are there. And in cities, I think the, you probably know the statistic better than I do, but it's about 15% in cities. The, the number of parking spaces, I think, in, in America add up to the size of Connecticut that are there. And again, in this world where it's not about car ownership, it's about getting from point A to point B, um, the, the need for those really changes. You can make parks out of parking spaces or you can use other, other forms uh, that are there, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. That's right, I and mean, we're already, as a result of Uber and Lyft, seeing significant declines in parking demand in cities like San Francisco, um, which are creating the opportunity for reconverting some of that space into more productive uses, converting on-street parking into protected bikeways that are increasing bike utilization in cities, um, and converting off-street parking into more economically useful uses like housing and shops. So um, let's take a question here from Facebook Live. Uh, as we start seeing more of these you know, multimodal systems developing, um, what does this mean for folks uh, you know, who, who need um, accessible solutions? Um, are we going to start seeing more emphasis placed on ADA compliant modes of transportation? Mm -hmm. Well, so this is one of the critical issues of the role of government <coughs> and particularly the role of public transit, um, ensuring Accessibility to all people, um, regardless of age or income or ability, is a critical function of government and public transit agencies. And one of the difficult relationships that public agencies have in terms of their authority to manage private services. Um, so there's the potential for um, using technology in order to provide a much higher level of service to people who are dependent upon public transit, but only if government continues to step it up in terms of either providing public services or incentivizing private users uh, and private providers in order to uh, uh, guarantee that service. Mm -hmm. uh, for us in our chariot service, uh, one of the important yeah. things that um, we offer is wheelchair accessible uh, vehicles uh, to you know make sharing available to those who use assistive devices. Um, but I think there's also a, a group of people that, quite frankly, are left out of access today um, with the dial-a-ride services that we have. Um, in many cases, you have to call 24 hours to a week in advance just to get a ride to a doctor's appointment. Um, these are highly, highly subsidized trips um, that uh, there's a huge opportunity to improve the way people get around there. Um, in New York, we also ran a mobility challenge. Um, one of the design prompts was around how to improve accessibility in the city. And we had a number of entrepreneurs come up with new ideas to improve um, how you might get around in New York. Uh, one of them was a gentleman in, uh, who used an electrified assistive device. And he said, you know, it, it's easy. You're installing all of these kiosks where you can charge your phone because people recognize smartphone access is really important. But 
somebody said, that same battery anxiety that you have on your phone, I have with my wheelchair. So when you put the Bluetooth thing up here for the phone, just stick a plug down here so that I can plug in my chair. Um, and it's only by going out and talking to people that we even learn that um, these are issues. And, and quite frankly, those can be solved pretty quickly. It's literally just relocating um, a plug when you're <coughs> installing other smart infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Raj, anything to add? Yeah, so this is a mode within Lyft that we think is really important. You, know, you can uh, accept, say that you need wheelchair accessible service, and, and we recognize that and then uh, find the nearest vehicle. The second piece that was discussed is around, um, especially around healthcare services. So we actually went backwards and did provide a phone number for people so that they could call a Lyft using a phone because it's something they were comfortable with, especially the elderly population. Um, but the fastest growing segment that we have in working with kind of third party organizations is, in fact, healthcare. And uh, going in, uh, working with assisted living homes and hospitals and being able to provide uh, rides. Um, and anything that doesn't require significant med medical assistance is something that we think will have an important place. We also think that's an opportunity when people say, oh my god, humans are going to go away uh, from the value chain in autonomous vehicles. We think there will be many needs to have human care, especially around this use case, that you will have so someone that's there to potentially assist someone coming into a vehicle, getting out of a vehicle, to, d to talk to them as well. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I have a lot of questions we didn't get to, uh, but uh, we're out of time. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks uh, to you guys for being an incredible audience. Um, we're going to move on to the next segment of our agenda today. Thank you. Great. Thanks.